evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Melanie brickman Porcher, and I'm Director of Life Sciences here at the New York Academy of Sciences. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all this evening in person and those of you joining us via live stream to tonight's program, What Happens When We Die? Sur surviving Cardiac Arrest. This lecture is co-presented with the Critical Care and Re Critical Care and Resuscitation Research Program at NYU Langone Health. I'd especially like to thank Dr. Sam Parnia of the NYU School of Medicine for his efforts in putting this series together. Dr. Parnia is Director of Critical Care and Resuscitation Research, Associate Professor of Medicine, and Co-Director of the Resuscitation Committee at NYU. And he will be moderating tonight's event. This evening's panel discussion will bring together leading physicians and researchers, including internationally recognized researcher in emergency cardiac care, Dr. Tom Ofterheide of the Medical College of Wisconsin, distinguished happiness research psychologist, Dr. Sonia Lubomirsky of the University of California, Riverside, world expert in neurological intensive care, Dr. Stefan Mayer of Wayne State School of Medicine, and leader in resuscitation science and post-cardiac arrest care, Dr. Sarah Perman of the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Thanks to you all for your participation. If you're not familiar with the New York Academy of Sciences, we are among the oldest scientific organizations in the United States. And we started just a few blocks away, right here in downtown Manhattan. In the past 200 years, we've grown from a small community of physicians and naturalists to a global organization with more than 20,000 members in 100 countries. In that time, the Academy has brought together communities from multiple sectors at conferences and events like the one today. They're designed to address pressing global challenges and to build a bridge between scientists and the public. For those of you who wish to relive today's experience, you will find this lecture online via the Academy's live stream channel. Now before we get started stretching our minds as we think about current scientific discoveries regarding our understanding of death and cardiac arrest, I'd like to ask you to keep our space quiet by please silencing your cell phones. And thank you all again. Now I'm happy to turn the stage over to Dr. Sam Parnia um, from our presenting partner, the Critical Care and Resuscitation Research Program at NYU Langone Health. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melanie. I'm very excited uh, to be able to have this discussion. I am also really honored uh, by our panelists here who are really absolute experts in different areas that as you see are completely aligned into this. Um, some of you may have been here earlier today. Um, for those of you who were here, um, I'm just going to recap uh, for everyone else what we talked about today, which is essentially that, um, and I'll be honest, everyone probably thinks that lives are very difficult, and life is very difficult. I don't doubt that at all when you look at it. But we all thought death was easy, right? Your heart stops, it's clear. When you're dead, you're dead, that's the end. What else could there possibly be? And that was true for millennia. Your heart stopped, you would stop breathing, your brain would shut down, no matter what caused that to happen, it was very clear. And then, in the mid-20th century, 1960, people discovered cardiopulmonary resuscitation, the ability to compress the chest and restart some sort of blood flow in people who would otherwise have died, even if they died dead. Um, but it didn't cause too much of a blurring in our understanding of death, because we thought that we only have five or 10 minutes before you end up with permanent irreversible, irretrievable brain cell damage from the time you stop blood flow to the brain. So amongst ourselves, clinicians, doctors, we just call it cardiac arrest, the heart stopping, when we're trying to save people. And then the moment that we decided it didn't work, or if people didn't want it to be done, we would just declare them dead on cardiopulmonary criteria. But yet, what's really amazing is now in the 21st century, what we talked about today is we've had science that has shown that actually it's only after a person dies that the cells inside the body start to undergo their own process of death. And that this doesn't happen over minutes, it could be hours of time, if not longer. And we don't really know when cells become irreversibly and irretrievably damaged. So it opens up an enormous opportunity for us to find new treatments that we can give to people who would otherwise have died from a reversible, treatable medical condition. Say a person of my age who has a heart attack and suddenly collapses and dies, but, but the rest of my organs are healthy, we can bring that person back if we find new treatments to preserve the brain, preserve the cells, go back and fix the underlying problem. And a number of our speakers, including Dr. Sam Tisherman, talked about this incredible work that's being done in this area. Now, not forgetting that there's a person there 
we are, have people who've gone beyond this traditional threshold of death for tens of minutes, if not longer, than that, and yet they've all come back and incredibly have described similar experiences about what it's like to go beyond the threshold of death. They've described feeling very peaceful. They've described the sensation of experiencing a light. But more importantly, they've described an incredible sensation, which I cannot explain, of reviewing their lives, reviewing everything that they've done from early childhood until that moment, but not just in some random order, but with the purpose of understanding their humanity. They re-experience things they've done to other people. If they've hurt people, they experience it, and they come to recognize that what they had done, perhaps in life, wasn't correct. And then they come back with a higher purpose. They're more altruistic. They're less afraid of death. They're more engaged with others. Why is it that when we die, we're going to experience this, and then when we come back and get a second chance, it changes us so much? So there's a lot to talk about. And of course, death doesn't just belong to physicians. It's not just about biology. You know, we have a whole um, history of people who have explored this, from philosophers to even theologians who have discussed you know, what happens when we die. So I recognize that people have different backgrounds, and we'll try to address all the different aspects of uh, our new discoveries in, in this field. So, without further ado, I would like to actually ask our panel then. Let's go back to what we've talked about today and recap it for everyone. So, tell me, what is death even? You know, we deal with it all the time. We thought it's easy. We do it in hospitals every day. It's part of our jobs in intensive care and emergency. Tom? Well, I think you've characterized it well. We don't know what death is. Um, when I went to medical school, I was taught that death occurred after th when the brain had, did not have oxygen for three minutes. That got kind of extended to maybe five or seven minutes uh, later. But the field of resuscitation has advanced so much. We are, for example, placing patients on, on ECMO, which is a uh, cardiopulmonary bypass machine to push blood around when we can't get a pulse. And those patients are getting one and a half hours, up to one and a half hours of CPR, and are capable of uh, return to life, a totally normal life. Uh, so this raises the question, uh, to be succinct, I would say death is an arbitrary decision by your treating physician. <laughs> I said it would get complicated. Right? Before it was easy, now it's not easy. Even death isn't easy anymore. If I may, uh, yes. if I may, yeah. I mean, I want to just reiterate uh, a point that you made before, Sam. Um, when you're a young doctor in training, I'm an intern, and one of your jobs in the middle of the night, it's always in the middle of the night, you declare people dead. And really all you have to do, you, the nurse will call, and you just, no breathing, no pulse, okay. But I think what's really opening a lot of eyes now is that that conventional criteria of, let's say, pulselessness for some arbitrary amount of time that can be quite short, 10, 15 minutes, uh, you know, we'll call the code, we walk away, and now we recognize all those cells are still alive in the body. They're not the organism from an organ function point of view, like the brain isn't acting like the brain ought to work. So there's like at the organism level, but a cellular level, at a cellular level, that process of those cells becoming permanently and irreversibly gone, hours or even days. And I think that that's what's really the big eye opener for us in resuscitation. What about you, Sarah? You work in the emergency department. Sure. So you deal with people all the time who come in. You deal with cardiac arrests. And I think I think it's I think you know to follow up on these two comments. I think it's clearly very challenging to come up with a true definition. I think um, you know I remember back to that similar overnight. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, I was always taught to take out my stethoscope and put it on my ears and listen, just to be 100% certain. Uh, which, in retrospect, is really not the definition. And I think that's what we're learning. And what we're trying to sort through is um, is that definition of what of, of what death is or is not, um, and especially in our situation with you know, strong keen interest in resuscitation and, and returning people to a good neurologic uh, recovery is is where can we intervene um, and potentially where can we not intervene? 
I mean, you know, I was asking even a simpler question, which is, I mean, because you're going to make it sound like now we're going to go to work tomorrow and no one knows how to declare people dead. We, we do it. We give a time of death. I do it all the time. We do it, we do it. In fact, we don't do it our interns do it. But nonetheless, but, but what I think what I was trying to get at is, you know, the, the perception, of course, is that it's this irreversible moment where you lose all life processes, which obviously occurs when the heart stops if you don't do anything about it. But what we're learning now is that the, the rule that we were told, which is that you only have three to five minutes before you get permanent brain damage from the time the heart stops, isn't true, and that it opens up these opportunities. But death still is, as, you know, the heart stops, breathing stops, and the brain shuts down. Am I right, Stefan? I mean, that's how we sort of look at it when we declare people dead, that, you know, if you shine a light on the pupils, the, the pupils are fixed and dilated uh, soon after the heart, immediately after the heart stops. And that's how we can declare people dead, if they didn't want to be resuscitated, for example. Right, but what I'm saying is, you know, that period of hypoxia, which, you know, every tissue in our body depends on for life, um, uh, in a way, a lot of times when we're declaring death, that's when the fun begins. And, and where this comes from are this accumulating, this accumulating evidence of stories where people come back um, after being clinically dead for hour, hour and a half, multiple hours, especially if they're hypothermic, which we can talk about, things that are really incredible. And, and you know, I just want to relate one story. I was reading one story about the typical thing with some woman, and they were coding her and doing chest compressions for two hours, and they decided to plug in the ECMO, and she's comatose, but now she's perfused and oxygenated from a, a machine, and she comes back, and then she's fine. And that never used to happen. And the article that I'm reading, it says, OK, this maybe happened, but it would be irresponsible. This is what the journalist said. It would be irresponsible to really talk about this a lot, because it could set unrealistic expectations for people in the public. And you know, I look at it the other way. I have a friend who says, with these recovery stories, he says, you know, if you don't believe in pink unicorns, all you need to see is one pink unicorn, and you know they're real. And, and it's those types of, can you top this, these incredible super survivor stories that are starting to blow people's minds, frankly, and really making us re-examine the art of the possible. So I, I think, Sam, what we're really saying is that death is not an event. It's a process. And the length of time of the process to eventually reach cellular, irreversible cellular death is unknown. Today, we are seeing people uh, return to normal life after one and a half to two hours of resuscitation. And we don't necessarily see an end in sight yet. You know, I'm so glad you say this because I, I was we were mentioning earlier in the in the back that I sometimes feel like we're the group of sort of people who maybe were saying things that sounded blasphemous from a medical perspective. You know, so and it's great to hear that you know there are people who are showing the same thing that we've come to the same conclusions. You know, I remember years ago I read this paper from Nature published in one of the top journals, if not the top journal, uh, in our field. And uh, it was a study from 2001 in which uh, researchers in California had actually taken brain biopsies from cadavers. Eight to 20 hours after these people had died, they were taking core brain biopsies and they had grown brain cells in the laboratory. And I was like, this is amazing. So this actually shows what I've been thinking for a long time, that these cells and people are not dying from the lack of oxygen deprivation. The only problem was everyone's been teaching us that oxygen deprivation causes cells to die. So I would tell people, thankfully I had the papers to show as my backup, and I think people did start to believe me. And then, of course, what happened in April, uh, just a few months ago, was that this group that we heard from today, Nena Sestan's group from Yale, published this incredible study where they took 32 pig brains, and they made a point that they didn't sacrifice any animals. These were from an abattoir, animals that had been killed for their meat, and their brains would have been discarded. They took those brains, took them four hours after the death, which is how long it took to go to the lab, and then they connected them with this particular solution that was like blood, but not quite blood. And they were able to restore most brain activity within six to 10 hours after that. I mean, what do you say about that? 
Uh, Tell us. <laughs> I was blown away. Well, I just, I just got to say, for, for context, uh, that article, which came out in Nature, appeared immediately from multiple friends of mine. Like, you got to see this. You're not going to believe this. They've reanimated, you know, a pink brain like four hours later, or whatever, after being dead. I mean, some really incredible groundbreaking stuff. And you know, I think it, it uh, you know, it, it doesn't give us answers, but it cracks open a lot of really interesting questions and opens up a lot of possibilities. I think it's also it. I think it challenges some of the notions that we have had up until now, because. You know, frequently when you are learning kind of uh, a normal medical training, you hear these hard and fast time frames as if something about a few minutes is integral to either having a good neurologic outcome versus not. And I think um, this sort of information I think is going to challenge that paradigm, which is, is fabulous because we see that paradigm challenge every day. But I think it's going to really uh, alter how people think about cardiac arrest and cardiopulmonary resuscitation um, because maybe that low flow state that we do with CPR for an hour or potentially even longer um, is not as devastating as, as we had thought and that we can recover people despite that time frame because of what we're learning about um, the strength and the ability of the brain to, to recover. Well, it also impacts how physicians should practice potentially. So currently today, uh, following cardiac arrest, the recommendation is to withdraw life-sustaining therapy um, at 72 hours, or to consider that uh, at three days. Um, we have new forms of resuscitation practice. I'm lucky enough to work with a interventional cardiologist, Demetrius Yiannopoulos, at the University of Minnesota, and we are placing refractory cardiac arrest patients. These are patients who don't respond to anything and have close to a 0% chance of survival. And we place them on uh, this bypass or ECMO uh, to perfuse blood since their heart isn't beating. And they receive uh, resuscitation for an hour, uh, up to an hour and a half. And our so that's done, by the way. I don't know if you were familiar with them. When you say that they're put on this bypass, and yes. can you tell it? I don't know. Uh, well, uh, a, Two catheters are placed, one in an artery, uh, yeah, usually in the upper leg, and one in the vein in uh, the upper leg. Uh, and the blood is circulated through the body uh, into uh, the artery and out the ve uh, vein. It is oxygenated in a machine and then sent back into the body. So it pushes blood around and it basically is a heart lung uh, bypass machine. And cool. And cool, yes. Um, our patients don't wake up for seven days on average, and uh, we've had patients uh, uh, begin to wake up as long as two weeks later. So now we look at physician practice of withdrawing life-sustaining therapy at three days. That really needs to be reconsidered, and I think that uh, the message needs to get out to uh, many different types of physicians. Uh, intensive care unit physicians, anesthesiologists, emergency physicians, cardiologists, all of the multidisciplinary team that treats these types of patients and reconsider how we're practicing. Yeah, I was gonna, um, so I'm a psychologist, so this is a little bit out of my comfort zone to talk to all you guys doctors, um, but I find this topic really fascinating. I'm interested in the psychology of it, so one is really following up to what um, Tom was saying. How is this new knowledge, new findings, new observations going to impact the psychology of the physicians. And I think it's sort of obvious that if physicians believe, you know, an outcome is likely that they're gonna be, they're gonna change their behavior, so if they're gonna start believing that um, they are able to resuscitate even after five minutes, then that's gonna change their behavior. Um, but we're also really interested in the psychology of the layperson, sort of everyone out there and their families, and how this new knowledge is gonna affect them, because obviously this can have huge ramifications in expectations of patients and their families, um, and you know how likely are people going to start signing those do not resuscitation orders? If now they know that maybe we should all be resuscitated, um, are they going to be really disappointed when people people are going to continue to die on a daily basis? So, so I'm really interested, I guess, in the ramifications of these new findings for you know everyone for lay people. Mm. 
Well, if, if, if I may, I want to just chime in about this. We, we heard today, if you weren't here earlier today, an incredible testimonial or, or story from a cardiac arrest survivor, a young lady who, uh, yeah, she just, she took a chemo med, her heart failed, she had a cardiac arrest, uh, maybe a good half hour or more of attendant CPR, could not get the pulse back. Team had walked away and declared her dead. And her cardiologist was running into that emergency department and said, oh, no, you don't. And he made the team continue for another hour working on her with this semi-effective chest compressions, got her on ECMO, ends up on mechanical support, LVAD, gets a heart transplant 10 years ago, and here she is now. And But the punchline was, she goes back to the cardiologist and says, how did you know? And he said, I just knew. Which really echoes a sentiment that, 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 that I've developed as well. And I might get in trouble for saying this, but I really, having been at the bedside, I do believe that there were two types of people at the time of death. There are the people where it is their time. And there are the people where it's not their time. And you can kind of feel it and you kind of know. And these sudden cardiac arrest cases are a lot of those. Um, uh, sometimes after an arrest, somebody is, you know, they've battled cancer for many years and they're really still and they feel cold and they're, and they're gray. But there's the other people where you see signs of life where they're still gasping, moving a little bit. They're more colorful when they're cyanotic. And, and I think that that recognizing that at least there is that segment, because certainly sometimes it is your time to go, and it's all, you know, one day it's going to happen to all of us. But it's like that old saying from Peter Saffer, the famous father of CPR. He said, death is not the enemy. It just sometimes needs a little help with timing. <laughs> I'm going to follow up with my favorite Peter Saffer quote. <laughs> <laughs> we all have them. As, as you were talking, I was thinking in, in my own mind, um, so Dr. Saffer said that cardiopulmonary cerebral resuscitation, because that was his term, um, is for the brain that's too good to die. Uh, and I thought that was really powerful. And so I think um, as we're talking about providers or even families, I think a lot of, a lot of what we do in this situation is sometimes setting expectations. Um, setting expectations for our medical team, but also setting expectations for the family. Um, but I think what's really important is uh, is looking at that individual and trying to help everyone kind of come to terms with what is potentially happening, thinking about who they are and making that decision because sometimes you do just know. Uh, so I think that cardiologist has a lot of credit for for uh, for pushing forward. Um, but I, I do think it's a it's a tough situation and it's emotionally tough for everyone clearly. Um, but but I always keep in the back of my mind. Uh, especially when I'm in a very difficult um, resuscitation, that, that, that um, cardiopulmonary cerebral resuscitation is for the brain that's too good to die. That's very beautiful. The way you put it. But, so let me ask you to pick up on this point then. I mean, I also want to make sure we don't want, to, I don't want us to give the wrong impression. And I think all of us, right, get phone calls from family members who say, oh, you know, so and so a family member has just died and I heard that they can be saved. That's not what we're saying. What we're sort of getting at is like, this is the analogy to the initial, you know, first flight with the Wright brothers, um, where forever people thought it was impossible to overcome gravity and fly, and but just by showing that it's possible to overcome gravity, even if it's just for 27 seconds, they changed our perception, and as a result of that, because we believe things are possible, then people worked on it, and then within 50, 60 years, people ended up on the moon. So we're not going to the moon right now, unfortunately. Let me just tell you, if you guys came here for me to say, or any of us to say. Here, this is a solution, you're not going to die, I don't have it. I will probably die before that comes up, I promise it. But I think we want to illustrate where this is going. And so with that, let me take a step back and actually say, you know, Stefan, you're a brain expert, you're a neurologist, you're the director of the Neurological uh, Critical Care Unit, uh, which you helped to found at Columbia, then at Mount Sinai. So the reality is that people are susceptible to brain damage when you stop blood flow. So we can say all these things and these experiments are being done, but 
none of us would want to have blood flow to our brain stop for 20 minutes. Right. So, so why, if it isn't the lack of oxygen that's causing the brain damage, why do people end up getting brain damage, and what's the new frontier that we have to fight? Sure. Um, well, in a cardiac arrest, it's you know, it's five minutes of no flow. Then it's 20 minutes on average of what you can think of as misery perfusion. Somebody pumping on your chest. And then if you're one of the lucky ones, and it's, you know, not the majority, then you get your heart beating again spontaneously. You know, we've got the heart back and everything else. Um, all those brain cells are alive, but they're pissed. <laughs> They're not happy campers. And um, entire uh, genetic pathways have already started to be activated. Uh, put very nicely by Lynn Becker, who I think is in the audience, uh, a real pioneer in resuscitation medicine, that, that there are self-protection programs being triggered. And then there's even a kind of a suicide switch, because a lot of the brain cells actually through the natural order of things, you know, it's time for them to shut down and new cells will come, just like for people on Earth. Some shut down, new human beings will come. And you get this kind of interplay and back programs, which will be most dominant, right? The standard program, the self-preservation, which makes everything shut down but might help you live, the, the, the death switch. And what plays out in the intensive care unit over days when you're in our ICU is, is, trying, is watching that play out. And sometimes things go, things go well. If things calm down and you see the patient start to move more, function neurologically, the brain waves become stronger. But other terrible things can happen. So for instance, electrically, you can have storms of uncontrolled seizure activity in the brain, converting huge areas of the brain from on the edge of life and death to dead tissue. Something we call non-convulsive status epilepticus and spreading depolarization. So it's, we're just kind of opening our eyes up to this. But, but it really is about the reperfusion injury, very viable brain. Tell us what that's that the new what? Tell us, tell, us, tell us what is reperfusion injury. So in other words, it's not the period that the heart wasn't beating, it's the fact that you've restarted the heart right. and you put oxygen back into those right. very upset cells, shall we say. Correct, very, very upset very cells. Upset. Very Unhappy upset. cells. With a lot of, lot of funky stuff going on, and now you're reperfusing and sending a lot of oxygen in. Maybe there's good evidence, as you know now, maybe too much oxygen, which actually might be uh, fueling a neurochemical fire of inflammation and secondary injury. This is our new battleground. And so to, to kind of bring it home, I, was, I always thought, well, you know, the brain injury happened on the sidewalk. And when they drag the guy in and he's on a ventilator, damage is done. And we're do, simply just doing support. And now we realize, no, that, that that's just the beginning of the fun. And that we really have a huge window with which to do the science understand, intervene. Hypothermia, which I don't think we've spoken about yet, is the mega game changer. It made a completely untreatable disease treatable and has massively improved outcomes all over the world. They're still not perfect, but they're a heck of a lot better than they used to be. Sam, Tom, anything bad about yeah, I, I would say that the, uh, uh, that's clearly uh, correct. The um, uh, the window of opportunity now and the future really is cerebral preservation to limit uh, cerebral damage. And there are many different ways that that can be accomplished. One is, as you mentioned, uh, the uh, reperfusion, limiting the damage that occurs from sudden reperfusion. And that can be done with slow perfusion. That can be done with a cocktail of medications and drugs. Uh, or single individual drugs. Uh, and Lance Becker is really in the forefront of uh, showing us the direction in which we need to go. Um, so there are many ways that we can uh, limit the damage to the brain um, and uh, further, perhaps, extend the time of successful resuscitation <laughs> and bring our patients back to a normal life. Sure, and just to, to follow up, just for everyone in the room who might not have been with us earlier today, 
Um, but to kind of comment a little bit on hypothermia, um, I think it's important to understand what we're talking about. I often will get questions with people thinking that we're doing something along the lines of science fiction and cryopreservation. Um, and really, that's, that's not what we're doing. We're actually doing more of a mild hypothermia. So we drop patients' core temperatures um, to about 33 degrees, which is, um, which is actually not that cold. You don't put your hand on someone and feel that they're cold to the touch. It's really a, a very mild decline in temperature. And our thought is that that actually uh, results in reducing a secondary injury from these oxygen cells and the inflammation that we've talked about, or the oxygen, excuse me, to the cells, mm -hmm. uh, and the inflammation that, um, that comes after the actual cardiac arrest event. And it's a therapy that, um, that we've been looking into and investigating and, and really refining for, uh, for over 15, 20, 25, 30 years. It's, it's not something that's really new to our post-arrest management, um, but we keep trying to tweak it to make it a little bit better uh, and to really make sure that we're getting um, our patients back to where they could potentially be optimized. So. And I think uh, perhaps the reason we haven't advanced uh, as quickly as we have in terms of cerebral preservation is that the techniques that work, we are finding, are completely counterintuitive. So rather than returning a blood pressure back to normal instantly, gradually increasing that pressure in a slow, progressive manner is much, much better. Rather than returning oxygen to its immediate prior level, in, uh, slowly increase the amount of oxygen. And this goes with all the cellular metabolism. Uh, the cellular metabolism is greatly altered, and if you suddenly bring it back the way it was uh, previously, it uh, is uh, damaging to, to the cells. So it's a counterintuitive process that is much more successful. That's incredible. I mean, so you really paved out this new option. Instead of giving up, we're now recognizing there's this incredible window of opportunity to do a lot more. And I want to come back to that because you know, you've told me privately, every single one of you, that you know, the challenge is that oftentimes physicians have a perception and therefore they stop or, or they withdraw life support early in the intensive care. You know, they don't give time for the treatments to work because they're thinking about what they had learned before. Maybe just touch on that for me and then I want to move on a little bit before we come back to other medical aspects that we would like to discuss. So, you know, I think you've all told me right, uh, privately, so please, what would you think about that? You know, I, I think, you know, doctors are pretty good at following rules. <laughs> and I, I just think that the, you know, we're writing the rule book, that's all. I mean, you know, if do this, you know, there's nothing in medicine more regimented and protocolized than ACLS. It is like, you know, by the book. What is ACLS? Uh, advanced cardiac life support. The algorithms the HA puts out, you know, pump this many minutes, you know, feel throat pulse, inject one milligram of epinephrine, shock 160, shock 260, shock, right? It's totally algorithmic. And we've also all been taught, as you guys know, after about half an hour, you know, it, nothing will work anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what's so mind blowing is, well then how do you explain the pink unicorn? You know, the people where they don't give up, like the lady that spoke at the conference today, where they they kept doing it for 90 minutes and then put her on a machine because her heart was not moving at all. They had every justification in the world to declare her dead and walk away. But they wouldn't. And, and now she's alive to show for it. So it's these examples that are making people say, wait a minute. So it's interesting that you bring that up because we actually did a little bit of qualitative work. Um, so we. Uh, did a study where we spoke with physicians to try and understand maybe what made them a little glass half full or glass half empty um, with respect to just this issue. And it was really fascinating. Some of the things that I took away, um, one, one physician actually told me that they thought that uh, having that pink unicorn totally changed their perspective. It was the person who they walked in the room thinking there's no chance, and then that person lived, and they had completely shifted their thought process from then forward. And I think, I think we see that. We see somebody uh, or a, a physician have kind of that experience and they really start to think a little bit differently. Um, one of the interesting comments that the same provider made to me was that um, with certain training restrictions now that we're seeing in younger physicians, 
They see less of these critical care patients. They see less survivors. They haven't had that pink unicorn yet. So I thought it was really interesting because we always think that um, that the young folks are really going to be the ones who are going to be kind of leading the charge and saying, oh, no, 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 you know, we have to do everything. Um, and what, what was being detailed to me in these qualitative interviews with multiple critical care intensivists was that, you know, you need that pink unicorn and then it, it throws it all out the window and you start looking at this very differently. So I think, I think Sonia said it best that we will change when the healthcare providers believe. Mm -hmm. I've had personal experience with this with our ECMO program in Minneapolis, with Dr. Yiannopoulos' program. We started, and these are very refractory patients who frankly have not survived previously. And they have really no signs of life. They come in, they're in a coma, they are now on this machine circulating blood around their body, and the hostility, anger, and resentment of the entire healthcare team of that unit was palpable. Is until, that true? Yes. Until the first patient uh, woke up uh -huh. and walked out the door and thanked everybody in the unit. Yeah. And then nobody, you couldn't stop them after that. Well, the same thing and, happened when we so, were rolling out uh, therapeutic hypothermia. You know, the first studies were done in 2002. <laughs> And I thought, well, that's it. And it was five years until we had our first, we started cooling in the Columbia Neuro ICU, getting the Neuro ICU, because the CCU didn't want anything to do with it. They thought, they said they wanted to do it under a, a research protocol. And I was like, wait a minute. It was already done under a research protocol, and it was published in the New England Journal. That's a pretty good journal, you know? <laughs> and so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can just start doing it. But it was the same thing, like, what? You're doing what? And but those, that first case, the second case, the third case, where you watch people recover, and then that's it. So I don't know of a unit in the world that started to do hypothermia for cardiac arrest that then quit it later and said, this, this doesn't work. I have yet to hear that story. Yeah, can I ask a question to clarify something kind of as a lay person here and also make a comment? Um, it seems to me that almost all the examples that I've heard of people having these incredible, kind of miraculous resuscitation stories are young, healthy people. They're not like the 80-year-old person with multiple health problems. So can we clarify whether that's the case? And second, because this is really going to feed into this debate we're having in society about extreme measures at the end of life, and should we put all this money into it, and people are suffering, so I think people are going to naturally ask those questions, are we just going to make that problem even worse? So, so cardiac arrest is interesting, and, and you, you, you point out exactly why it's interesting. It's so heterogeneous. It's, it's such a, 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 a diversity in terms of who has a cardiac arrest, and, and I've even had some of my colleagues say, can you call that one cardiac arrest and maybe this one heart arrest so we can clarify, uh, to which I always say no because I don't know I'm in the ER and I don't know exactly what caused what, but, um, but I think that's a really good point and you know, frequently when we talk about cardiac arrest, um, we don't specify and say this is the, the 20 to 45 who are at risk of an opioid overdose or an inherent dysrhythmia, um, the 55 year old population that's had a massive myocardial infarction or a big heart attack that's resulted in cardiac arrest. And then people who are in that older end of age who maybe do have uh, a long-standing chronic condition. We tend to kind of lump it all together because we just don't really know how to designate. Um, but I will say, uh, you know, there, there has been, in cardiac arrest, there has been a little bit of an ageism where people immediately assume if you're older <coughs> than 60 and you have a medical comorbidity, you're just going to do terribly. And, and there's a ton of literature to say that that's actually not the case. Um, and, and I think the important thing you know, to, to take home is that you know, these are important conversations to have. I, you know, as, a, as an ER doctor who does post-resuscitation care and is very interested in neuroprognostication and, and DNR and withdrawal, I, you know, I encourage everyone to have those conversations because there are people who really shouldn't have CPR. Right. And there are people who really should not undergo all of these interventions. Um, but again, I think what we're left with is that brain that's too good to die. And so I can't say that because you're 
40, I should do everything for you, but because you're 70, I yeah. should. Well, I have a couple thoughts if I may share. Yes. Um, it's a really important part of critical care medicine is relieving suffering. And every intensivist you ever meet is going to tell you that the most common form of suffering they see are people that have been battling uh, one or more chronic diseases or cancer or something like that. And they're, over years, literally, I mean, people's bodies kind of start to just fall apart. They're on dialysis. They've got metastatic cancer. And, you know, it, it does always end in the same way for everyone. It's our one universal common destiny. And along the way, with so much of what medicine can offer, uh, yeah, that last round of chemo, but the side effects are horrific. And, and you see the misery. And sometimes, the right thing to do and what the patient really wants is is to say it's okay and that's enough and to stop. It's a, I mean, very, very, you know, it's crucially important to accept the inevitable. Um, that being said, I think what we're kind of focusing on more are those, wait a minute, you know, uh, and, and, you know, I, I'm going to tell you something that's going to really shock everyone in this audience, but guess what? young people <laughs> tend to have a better chance to recover from serious life-threatening illness and recover from brain injury. That's the way it is. So to get to your uh, question of point, Sonia, a lot of times when you're, when you're pushing the boundary uh, and, and forging new frontiers in medicine, you've got to start with uh, the, the optimal type of patient, which whether it's a stroke, which is also what happened in stroke therapy, or cardiac arrest, you, you say, look, this is what's possible if you're under 60, or whatever it is. But once you establish that, you know what happens next. The next studies are, OK, what about 60 to 75? Mm -hmm. Literally, this has happened in stroke. It's happened with thrombolytic. I'm sure it's happened in a lot of areas in, in, in critical care and emergency medicine. So in a way, it's. It's sort of the, the natural progression of how you advance, you know, the building blocks. So, uh, just a, a couple of additional comments. I personally believe that address, adequately addressing end of life issues in this country is a national public health problem. Um, I'm an ER doc, patients come in all the time. Uh, end stage everything, 96 years old, but no one has addressed end of life issues. It's not well known that if you call the paramedics uh, and there's no do not resuscitate, they have to, by law, attempt resuscitation. And it's not uncommon to have people resuscitated successfully that never wanted to. So addressing end of life issues is really, really important for our loved ones. Okay? And it's not adequately done in the U.S. The other thing I think is not appreciated uh, by the public is how young cardiac arrest patients can be. Our youngest was 24. Uh, we had a 33-year-old recently. Naturally. The average time, uh, the average age of our, our ECMO patients is 53 years old. These are people in the prime of their life. Uh, and they have brains too good to die. I think, you know, I think that um, just to sort of, if I can also not, not be a moderator, just express an opinion if I'm paying at this point, I think the way to think about death is, and cardiac arrest, is that if you we die of something that is treatable at any given time, so today, let's say, a heart attack is treatable, um, then I think people should do everything that's possible, as long as that, obviously, that person would agree. But on the end, yes, if you have a 96-year-old who's got metastatic cancer, and for whom there's no chemotherapy that works anymore, then we really shouldn't try in it. Because even if you restart the heart, it's just going to stop again if you can't stop the fuel uh, that's leading to that event. And I think that would be, probably would agree with that. So we're talking about that death now. I want to move on a little bit, if you don't mind, since, as I said earlier, um, there is no way that we're going to be able to stop this happening to us. Um, I got interested in this in my early 20s um, when I saw a patient who I got to know on a personal level. We talked about it earlier today, who then Unfortunately, half an hour after I spoke to him, who was a delightful man, unexpectedly had a cardiac arrest. It was very prolonged. He was bleeding. They were trying to fix him. And they tried for an hour. Clearly, he died at some point there. And I just witnessed this. And I remember thinking to myself, what happened to this sweet human being, this conscious person who was with us? 
And I've heard about people who had described you know, hearing and seeing things during their cardiac arrest resuscitation. And again, being only 22, 23 years old, I decided, oh, this is great. I'll just do this as my own research. When I, when I graduate from medical school, I'm going to do this, and I'll figure out the answers in a year or two maximum during my residency, and then I'll move on to the rest of my training. And of course, now I look back, I changed as a person. I'm now approaching 50. I'm no longer that younger person. I recognize that my heart will stop sometime. In fact, if you use online calculators, I have about 30 years left, the length of the mortgage, so get ready for it. So I'm not pretending this is not going to happen to us. So now, what then you see is incredible, is that there are these people who've literally gone and been brought back. And they've all described this very unusual but consistent experience of this period of death, where essentially they've described watching doctors and nurses working on them, which we cannot explain. I remember uh, Sue, Early on in my career, one of my colleagues told me that he was completely freaked by a patient who had been young, who had tried to resuscitate, took for 45 minutes, they stopped resuscitating him, he went to write the notes, came back in the room and noticed that this person wasn't quite as blue as when he left him, and then felt a pulse, and this kid had a pulse again, so he said, what do you do, he's gonna, how could this be, he's definitely at least going to be brain dead, and not only did he not get brain dead, he actually saw the doctor a week later and told him everything that had happened, the conversations, the events, the, the, all the details, which of course completely freaked him out. Um, so going to this, which I, I realize death is a complete mystery and we don't understand much about it, I, I want to ask you, Tom, because you have been involved, you've been one of the physicians, and I've met many people like you, who've been involved with these cases where you've resuscitated and people have come back and told you all. Yes, I have a, a, a story from my very first day as a doctor. So you have to go way back to 1980. And I was lucky enough to be on call the first day as a doctor. It's kind of characterizes my entire medical career. Um, but um, uh, I was appropriately nervous, and I had a second year supervising resident. And uh, he assured me, and Tom, I'll be there the entire night. Don't worry. You know, got your back. Um, just do the best you can. So about 3 in the morning, he, he comes to me and says, you know, I'm awfully tired. I'm going to the call room. I'm going to go to sleep. Well, shortly after that, I got a call to the coronary care unit uh, with a new patient. And I went up. I introduced myself. And um, my patient's eyes rolled up in the back of his head, and he flopped back down on the bed. Now, being pretty much a layperson, I knew that there were only two options. Either he had fainted or my worst nightmare had occurred. And he had actually had a cardiac arrest right in front of me on my first day. And this fleeting thought went through my head of anger that my second year resident had not done what he said he was gonna do, which was supervise me and be there. Um, however, I realized that this really was a cardiac arrest only because the entire nursing staff of the CCU was running to my room with terrified looks on their face. So I jumped right in, I started CPR, and this was in the days where we didn't even know the cause of a heart attack, which is an occlusion of a blood vessel to the heart. And we simply allowed the heart attack to complete, kept the patient comfortable with morphine, and if they arrested and their heart stopped, we defibrillate them. Uh, and, and attempt to bring them back. Um, so, uh, started CPR, uh, defibrillated, uh, the code team uh, uh, eventually showed up, uh, he got intubated, and was very refractory. So he did not get a pulse back for at least 25 minutes. Shot, 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 shot. Finally, after 25 minutes, uh, we got a pulse. And um, unfortunately, he continued to then have another cardiac arrest about every five minutes. Well, this went on for an hour. Every five minutes he had to be shot. Finally, the code team said, well, we can't stay here all day. You're the intern. Here, you, you shot it. Okay? Well, give us a call if uh, you need our help. And so everybody left, and I was again left alone with my, my new patient. Um, and continued to shock him about it. And, and they were pretty sure he was going to die, right? Uh, well, he there wasn't a lot of optimism. Is uh, correct, yeah. correct. The, the prognosis was, was not That's why they're alive. 
So uh, I continued to do this, and uh, very thankfully, one shock and the pulse would come back. It'd be good for another five minutes. Uh, and then I had to do it again. Well, this went on all morning. Um, I had a, a couple minutes in between shocks to run and talk to his wife, and honestly, I painted a very bleak picture with her. Um, came back just in time to shock him again. Um, then his lunch showed up, and uh, he wasn't going to eat it. I didn't get breakfast, <laughs> so I ate his lunch. Okay? Uh, in, in between defibrillation. So, um, about one o'clock in the afternoon, he finally stabilized and had a very rocky hospital course and uh, finally was about to go home 30 days later. So on rounds, I went in into the room to say goodbye to him. And uh, to my surprise, he said, uh, please come in, shut the door, and sit down. We have to talk. <laughs> and so I did, and I sat down. Um, uh, I said, well, what, what can we help you with? He said, well, you know, when you, first of all, I know you're an intern, but you've spent the most time with me. All the rest of the people come in for 30 seconds every morning and leave, so I consider you my doctor, and I need your help with an experience that I had when I died. And I got to tell you about this, and I need your help to process it. I said, well, go ahead. He said, well, I said, uh, when I arrested, I said, um, I left my body, and I floated to the top of the ceiling, and I watched you. And you took this machine, and you would shock it. Um, and what I noticed is you would do that every time my heart monitor would get kind of sawtooth. And then it would come back to more normal, and, and you would repeatedly do that. Um, he said, well, then, then you went out and talked to my wife. And frankly, I didn't think you were very positive in your discussion. <laughs> you could have been more, more positive. He <laughs> said, and then, if that wasn't bad enough, you ate my lunch. <laughs> But then he said something that really got my attention. And he said, you know, the one thing, though, that, that uh, I wanted to tell you was that here I was dying in front of you, and you were standing there feeling sorry for yourself because your senior resident didn't, uh, didn't back you up and left you alone. That got my attention. And it got my attention because he told me what I thought. And to this day, I could rationalize. I could rationalize the wife told him about my discussion. The nurses told him about the lunch. He saw a reflection in the window of his cardiac rhythm. But I cannot understand how he knew what I thought. And that got my attention. Well, I didn't know what this phenomenon was, and so I said, well, why don't you talk to your minister? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so in addition to this, he had a whole other very detailed experience. Uh, he had a complete life review, as you, you've talked about. Um, he went down a tunnel toward the light. He had had what I would characterize as a deceased family reunion. Um, he talked with his grandfather, his grandmother, his mother's father. Uh, his pet dog was there that had uh, died. Um, he has talked with a being of light. Um, he had some insights about both his life and his purpose in life, and was ultimately told that he needed to return. And he came back. And he wanted help with this. So I, I told him um, I didn't know what this was at the time. And so I said, well, talk to your minister. And he said, well, I did. But I got halfway through my story, and he said, that's not in the Bible. Walked out and slammed the door. <laughs> so I said, well, I don't know what this was, but um, I'll try to find somebody who does. So I called their psychiatrist. And I got halfway through the story, and the psychiatrist said, this is ridiculous, and hung up on it. <laughs> so 
that event got me very interested in this phenomenon because the minister wasn't any help. The psychiatrist wasn't any help. Sam was only like 10 years old. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom Ostrey wasn't any help. <laughs> Um, and it wasn't until I actually bumped into uh, Dr. Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, that I recognized uh, this phenomenon. And in fact, throughout my career, there have been a number of uh, similar uh, uh, stories that uh, resuscitated patients have shared. And it's, it's really incredible because I, you know, I would be very skeptical if I were to hear that. Um, I, I know you, and so I obviously, you know, it's different. But we've all heard about them, and they're difficult to explain, but I also, you know, when I started, people have heard about my interest, and I had hundreds and hundreds of people writing to me with these experiences, and when you met them, face, I interviewed them in person, you meet them face to face, you know, and sometimes children who were less than three or four years old who had no concept of what it's like to die, what happens when we die, none of these things, and it really touched me, and in particular, as I said, this concept that people review their humanity uh, in, in that period, you know, what, why should it be? That when we die, I mean, I don't know if that's really going to happen when we're going to die. I don't know what we're going to experience. But since there are so many accounts and they're consistent and they're universal, they've been described from all over the world. T tell me so I can better understand, because I haven't figured it out after 20 years. You know, why should we review our lives when we die? Why is it that these people come back and they're transformed? They're more altruistic. They have more purpose in life. Your scientists from different backgrounds tell me so we can try to understand them at least move forward. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot. I don't have all the answers, Sam, but I want to share some of my thoughts about this. Uh, you know, one of the big disease states that, that I've done research on for many years are a bomb in the brain, brain aneurysms, which are similar to cardiac arrest. It's like one minute you're fine, boom, struck it down, right? Comatose people literally drop dead and die before they make it to a hospital. Uh, they come with massive amounts of brain damage. Some are lucky, they don't really have brain damage, just the worst headache of their life. The aneurysm can re-bleed at any time. They undergo emergency neurosurgery to clip or coil the aneurysm. You have to get them through about two weeks of neurointensive care with uh, you know, evolving brain swelling, brain inflammation, all that. And then people would come back and see me uh, weeks or a couple of months later. And um, Many of them seem outwardly to be fine, but a lot of people really do have sequelae of brain damage, the memory's off, or the right hand doesn't work as well. And uh, we did an outcomes project, and we systematically asked everybody one question, in addition to a bunch of stuff, which was, right now as you stand here today, is your life worse, the same, or better than before you had this neurologic near-death experience. And we were shocked to find that just about 70% of people responded that their life was better. And uh, very few said it was worse. And, and that phenomenon, I think, is, is interesting. It's, I call it the My Stroke of Insight phenomenon. There was that book by the Harvard neuroscientist that had the brain ADM, a similar illness. And, you know, something that I've also experienced as an ICU doc, walking through the neuro ICU on a daily basis with a unit full of human beings that were fine one moment and now they're fighting for their life. And you learn that life is unbelievably fragile and there are, there are, you know, are no guarantees. So for those guys, the brain aneurysm survivors, they're like, they've got a second chance. Just like the cardiac arrest survivors, and how many people get a second chance on life? And what I think it does is it helps you with your priorities. And you learn to quickly understand what does it matter at all. The bullshit doesn't matter. And you become more centered and focused on human connectedness, which I'd love to hear you talk a little more about, Sonia. Um, relationships, altruism, and it's almost like I feel, Sam, I don't think there's some like neuro switch for this. I think that all within us. But it's getting that close and coming back from the brain that helps you really appreciate the preciousness and specialness of life that was there all along that, that sometimes we lose sight of. 
Let me bring Sonia into this. I mean, we, we've all been talking about medical perspective. Sonia's a professor of psychology. She's also the leading or one of the leading experts in the world on happiness. And what I can tell you right now, if I polled everyone, I'm happy to do it, but I know the answer is going to be 100%. Nobody wants to die, and everyone wants to be happy. So forget about us, let's talk to Sonia. She's your key, that's the person you want to talk to. So Sonia, you've researched this, you've published papers, I've seen some of them you know, referenced 6,000 times, I really admire you. So tell us, tell us, what happened? I wanted to respond. <clears throat> so I wasn't surprised at all at that 70%. They said they're like, we're, we're better. Um, for the same reason that, for example, do you know who, in, you know, in terms of age, what, what age period is the happiest? It's from mid-60s to early 70s. Um, I think for sort of similar reasons. Um, and of course, you all, we all say, oh, I don't want to be 70. I want to be uh, 29 or 35. Um, and yet people who are older have this sort of this w emotional wisdom. Uh, they have this perspective that younger people don't have. There's lots of research on what's called post-traumatic growth. And it turns out that human beings are really resilient. And after they have various kinds of traumatic or adverse experiences, including, I would imagine, uh, I don't want to call it near-death experience, but whatever the, the right term is, people feel um, uh, like they have, they know what their priorities are better. Actually, one of the most famous studies was done on women with breast cancer. Um, and the studies, surprisingly at the time, showed that these women with breast cancer basically said their life was better now, right? So that, that they were not happy that they had the cancer, but they're happier uh, as a consequence of it. And what they said was, they, they realize what their true priorities are, which, by the way, differ for everyone. Uh, it's not always family over work, right, which is kind of a stereotype. Um, they found out who their true friends were. Um, they found out that they had, they had strengths that they didn't realize they had. Um, and, so, and so, yeah, so I'm interested in the psychology of the survivors and what happens to them afterwards. Um, and it's going to be hard to separate just surviving the experience and just feeling like, wow, I survived. So, that's going to make you feel, research shows, more grateful and more social and feel like your relationships are, bet, are more important to you than they were before. But then also, the ones who were aware during that experience, that's a whole other story, which I Sam is studying. And I, I, I'm really impressed at how just systematically they're studying it, because like, we don't really understand why they're having these experiences of life review and this presence and the light. But so all we can do really do is just try to be systematic as possible and to get like hundreds of people who have these experiences. And if they all tell the same story, that's pretty interesting, given that a lot of them are from different cultures, or they've never told anyone, so they're not just trying to seek attention. Um, but you know, my research is on how people can become happier. And the key is really a connection, and their gratitude, and their altruism, or pro-social behavior, which I should say connection is, uh, is really, they have all those things to have in common. Because when you're grateful, usually people are grateful for other people in their life. So it's about feeling more connected to the people who have helped you and supported you. Um, and then I do lots of studies where I, where I basically do interventions, asking people to do acts of kindness, sort of more than they usually do, and people become happier, and they become healthier too. So um, to me, it all kind of makes sense. But we just need more really systematic research to study people who have these experiences and to find the common patterns. What about what about you know what society tells us all the time? You know the so-called uh, tell us and expand on it, the hedonic treadmill. You know, is that what we do? We just keep on seeking the next satisfaction, or is there more to? Like I, I tell you right now, everyone wants to find the, the quest to happiness. They're not interested in the stuff we're doing. So tell us, what are the things that we're being told erroneously? And sure. What are the things that would help? I have a book, and I'm, I'm not here to plug my books, but I have a book called The Myths of Happiness, but that's exactly about that. It's about myths that we or uh, preconceptions that we have about what will make us happy. And some of them are things like uh, just having more stuff and having more money or just even succeeding. Um, uh, because what's, what happens when, when we achieve anything is we kind of achieve it, we reach our goal, and then we adapt to it, we get used to it, we start taking it for granted. And you could argue that that's really a good thing, that human beings would not ever make progress if we kind of achieved a goal and then became sort of satisfied and then we'd stagnate. So, so kind of the, the cost of, of that maybe, maybe evolutionary adaptation is that we continue seeking. And so we always want more, that's the thought and treadmill. Um, but I think a lot of us, I'm sure probably everyone in this room also understands that materialism is not gonna make us happy uh, and that our relationships are important to us and it's important to be grateful for what we have. Um, I mean, so really the key, and it's important to help others, the key really then is to, to actually like apply that philosophy or wisdom in your own life because we get so busy 
the one thing I'm interested, for example, is that these some of these individuals will have these transformative experiences after death. You know, how how long does that last? Because we all know people lifetime. Lifetime. So I mean, that's that's really fascinating because that kind of goes contrary to all the research that I've seen, which is that people who've had you know like you've had a near accident, so you didn't really die, but you almost got hit by a car, or even like outward bound experiences sometimes, or, or sometimes you have a child and you feel like you've changed forever, but really you haven't because you know, a few years later you kind of go back to where you were before. So, you know, this is fascinating because we've talked about it, and I, I do want to say, you know, doctors, we don't own the subject of what happens when we die. You know, this is a, there's been an age old discussion on this way before we got involved in, you know, 2019 or whenever we want to think about it. But one of the things that I think you know has come about is that there is this transformation that occurs that you've mentioned. And I do have to point out that there's at least one study that's shown that it seems to be directly related to the experience. In other words, Pinran Lommel published this in The Lancet in 2001 that showed that people who survived a cardiac arrest compared them for eight years, those who had an experience and those who didn't. Those who had the they both were transformed, but those who had the experience were much more highly transformed. But, but another point that we've talked about is, you know, and again, before us, before, before physicians, before psychologists, philosophers were talking about this whole question of what happens when we die. There's this age-old discussion about the whole mind-body problem. You know, what is it like to be conscious? Where does our consciousness come to be? How does it come to be? Now, before I ask you those questions, which I haven't got answers to, too, but I'm glad that you're here, I just want to point out that the greatest thinkers of all time haven't answered them and haven't been able to su succeed. People like Plato and Aristotle and Avicenna and all these others, so feel free if you don't have the answer. But if you have it, tell us. How does the conscious self come to arise from the brain? And how do we explain this in the setting of cardiac arrest, where essentially there is either at best severely disordered brain, or oftentimes there is no brain function. You know, there are no brain stem reflexes. You can put a breathing tube down someone's throat. They won't have a gag. So tell me what you think about it, and we'll try to address this age-old question in the next few minutes. Okay. Yes. So I'm, the, I'm the brain guy. Okay. Um, well, so there's this uh, reductionist point of view, which would mean that consciousness can be explained as a purely biological process and nothing more. And there are a lot of theories, as you've pointed out, Sam, about what would explain it, what is the biologic and physiologic basis of consciousness, this magic ability of us to perceive and experience and that that's quite universal with all kinds of other organisms and animals and the whole thing and it really is amazing that what vexes us is that no one seems to have nailed it there's no universally accepted heuristic framework or understanding for how our our consciousness comes to life there are some good theories and and you know, the one that I like the best is this idea that it's an integrative process. Uh, it's one particular theory but that was promulgated by an NYU professor, Rodolfo Linus, in fact, of uh, high-frequency brain scanning coming from these core structures called the thalamus. And there's a little bit of presto there. And somehow it creates a conscious experience. I think where the tension comes in and then, and then if you believe that, then you die, you can't be conscious, and that's it. And you're gone forever and people will remember you. I think where the tension comes in is that it was Sigmund Freud who really put it first, and I've seen this firsthand. There's something about consciousness for us as human beings where we really can't conceive of our own annihilation. It, it, it's just something sort of inconceivable about it. And that's where the whole concept of the afterlife comes from, which, you know, there are all kinds of ways to conceptualize that, but part of something bigger, getting into spiritual things, uh, the collective consciousness of Erickson and, and the Buddhist principles, all of it, that somehow that whatever it is, that creates our consciousness. Maybe we're feeding into some other strange electromagnetic power that we can't measure and don't know is there, but it's real. And and I you know and we're really out there now in sort of you know deep space nine in terms of mysteries. We we just don't know, but that seems to be 
uh, the you know the the you know the, the, the two poles and, and where we're sort of stuck is units. So so I'm an emergency physician and I have a much simpler approach to this. Um, yeah, yeah, they, 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 yes. <laughs> and and uh, um, I go to what I consider the definitive most reliable source on death. And those are people who've experienced it. So I have been, uh, I have, I've been president of a number of national organizations uh, that uh, CPR organizations and we bring in survivors. And I've had the opportunity to talk with uh, many uh, survivors, uh, many of which have had this type of an experience. And I think uh, to a person um, they've told me uh, there's no controversy here. The, the consciousness and my spirit is separate from the body, and it lives on. Uh, anything else you'd like to know, Doctor? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've gone to the definitive source, and I'll take it at that. And I guess any other? So I was asking for the uh, fixing the mind-body problem. I guess we can't fix it in the next couple of minutes. But, <laughs> You know, um, any other comments? I think, you know, you pointed, I mean, you've come to sort of a different subject, and I think that you know, where I find it interesting, and I don't have answers, of course, is that what I noticed is patients coming back and being able to record exact details. In other words, how can you have a well-structured, lucid thought processes occurring? Normally, when that occurs under these circumstances, if you put an EEG, a machine to measure electricity in my brain, you see multiple parts of my cortex, the surface of my brain, integrating together. Yet now you look at people, and that, you know, our models all worked for, 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 for us, that makes sense. But then you have people who've gone through this sort of clinical death, or whatever you want to call it, the brain is shut down, there isn't blood flow really getting there, there's inadequate blood flow. If there's any activity, it's very little. It's not the same as what we see currently, but yet they have well-structured, lucid thought processes of memory formation, and there's these transformative experiences that, of course, stays with them for life. I don't know what it is, but it is interesting, as, as you pointed out, Tom, that a lot of them come back and they feel that um, they do become more, they find a deeper sense of purpose, and they even become more spiritual. Now, I, I just want to bring this in because I wasn't so interested in this concept of you know, me coming close to my own death, but now I see it, and I talk to my palliative care colleagues, and we see that at the end of life, of course, for people who are truly realizing they're about to go in the next few days, hours, weeks, then the issue of sort of, for lack of a better term, spirituality or meaning in life becomes very important. In fact, it's, it's an integral part of palliative care. So how do we address this aspect of death in the last few minutes that we have to discuss this? I might make just a quick corollary, uh, not to, sorry, but not to directly answer uh, your question, but perhaps on the last topic that might have relevance to this, was a book by Melvin Morse, who did pediatric near-death experiences. And children tend to be brutally honest, okay, as opposed to adults. And uh, he was talking to a seven-year-old uh, that he resuscitated from drowning. And the seven-year-old was going through this near-death story with him um, about going down a tunnel and, and talking to a being of light and so forth. And she could see that uh, Dr. Morse was not buying this. Yeah, he had a pretty skeptical look at his face. Um, he had not gotten into this I issue yet. And um, she told the whole story, tried to convince him, could see that this was, he wasn't buying it at all. And just finally finished and said, well, you know, I have to tell you, Dr. Morse, heaven is a beautiful, wonderful place. You'll see. <laughs> I think that the, the one thing that we do know, of course, is that we're all going to, to face this eventuality. Um, so let's go back to the world of the living and the realities of what we have to do in our medical practice. We only have a couple of minutes before I want to open up to questions for the audience. But um, one of the key things, that, and my boss at work, uh, Dan Sturman, brought this up to me, and he was like, well, with this pig study that came out of Yale, it's going to really impact the organ transplant it's going to adversely impact organ transplantation. And I said, I don't think that should be the case, in fact. I think it's completely opposite. And today, during our meeting, Lance Becker brought this up. You know, the fact that if we can identify 
that actually cells are not dying as we thought they would, and we can find new cocktails of treatments to try to preserve them, then actually tell you how does that impact our organ transplant programs and the ability to, to provide life to those even if the person we're trying to save couldn't be brought back to life again. But if, if I may, um, let's, let's um, take a, a very practical example, which is the incredible research in my mind that Tom is involved with in uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, where they're taking young guys that had defibrillators, and usually they respond great to shock. But there are these guys where you shock them seven times in half an hour and you can't get them back. And, and historically, they called the code in the field or called the code at some point and they died. And now they're doing a protocol where they're taking these guys, they're putting them on an automated pumper called a Lucas. They're, they're planning ECMO. They show up at the hospital. They're getting cannulated and going artificial or you know, cardiopulmonary life support, an average of one hour. Right? In the old paradigm, they've, they've been dead for half an hour. Not much different, right? Their skin paints up, they're perfused. They have to get that heart beating again. The heart is still not moving. And a lot of times, it's a heart attack. They open the coronary. They can get the heart beating. And then incredibly, because they're cold, the brain wakes up. And if I'm not mistaken, I've, I've read some of uh, Dr. Ionides' early reports. Somewhere in the ballpark, they have you get the guy back, and he goes on to live a life, and he's 50, right? That's amazing. That that's right. That's that's amazing. Now, what about the other half of people? So, what will end up invariably happening is you've got them on ECMO, but either the heart won't come back, or the heart comes back, but the brain damage is so massive that the family would say they wouldn't want to continue on like this. Now you've got these individuals where before you turn off the ECMO, and we can talk about how traumatic that can be, you can now say you've got a whole new population of people where you can say, we fought, we did everything, we enrolled the patient in this you know, completely science fiction protocol, we did everything above and beyond, sometimes we went, this time we didn't. But there's still an opportunity to create some meaning and some life out of what otherwise would have been a census tragedy and sure death, because all those guys were declared dead in the field. We've got kidneys that work. We've got a liver that works. We have lungs that are in good shape. And we can now offer the gift of life if you think he or she would want that. So in a way, the way that I see it, this and you know, these advances in resuscitation may actually lead towards filling that on that need, that gap for, for organs. And really, you know, a lot of people might say, no, nah, he didn't want to donate. <laughs> but think about it, right? A lot of people would say, Thank you so much for everything you did. And of course, you know, as as somebody that tried to benefit from everything that medicine has to offer, of course, he or she would want to do the same. I think to follow up on that too, we've been talking a lot about um, about individuals who are resuscitated to the maximum and who make their way into the hospital and get cannulated for ECMO. I think what some of this might even do is again stretch um, maybe even some of our pre-hospital notions about how long we can resuscitate or even our emergent notions about how long we can resuscitate where we actually get maybe a higher proportion of people get their pulse back after a cardiac arrest, even without very dramatic measures, we're just giving them a little bit more time. Um, and, and yes, maybe you know, with some of our advances in neuroprognosis and neuroprognostication, we'll be able to say, this person probably is not going to wake up, but would be a tremendous um, potential donor. And especially I think what we're gonna do, what we're gonna you know, see with some of this is, is maximum therapy. So we're not gonna see very quick notions that, well, downtime of 20 minutes, let's you know, call in the, uh, the chaplain and start having family meetings, but maybe we'll see a little bit more of a, a delayed neuroprognostication because we know that the exposure maybe is not as 
devastating as we, and we'll be giving maximum therapies to these individuals, and if they don't wake up and they don't have a good neurologic outcome, we've actually supported their organs in the duration, and now all of a sudden we have an opportunity for this person whose life is potentially ending tragically early or whatever the situation, but for them to potentially um, donate and give to somebody who could then have many years of life. So I actually think that, you know, I don't see it as a, um, as a, a as a, a detriment to organ donation. I actually think, I think it might actually help us. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think that's really incredible. I think um, I do want to open up for questions. Um, there's a lot more that we could obviously talk about, but everyone's been uh, listening to us. So um, are there any questions from the audience? Okay. Do we have a mic that we're going to be passing around? Are we rare? Oh, one there? I think there's a mic on the stand back there <laughs> and back there. I'll start with the gentleman at the front, please. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Hello? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. So you've spoken a lot tonight about defining death and about resuscitation. Um, in the context of resuscitation, how do you find, define acceptable life? In other words, now that we can prognosticate better, now that we have a larger window to resuscitate, uh, what are the ethics and what are the pragmatics of bringing someone back if they might not have motor control, or they might have greatly diminished mental capacity, or they might not even have a, their former personality? Where do you draw that line? It, do you mind, right? Because as I, I'm as a neurointensivist, here's how it works. We're, the neuro person's called in to give their best guesstimate. And if that sounds scary, it kind of is. Um, you just give you, and you kind of talk in rough categories of, you know, bed bound, hobbling with a cane, but able to go home, or really pretty good, and, and, and such. But you're dealing with eventualities, and you know, I always say, the thing is, these are all just kind of uh, percentages, but everyone's got one story. Like, you've got to work with the family to do your best to make the decisions that you think best reflect what the patient would want. And the hardest part is some, sometimes helping that disconnect. I mean, I've had families literally say, he'd never want to live like this if what I'm hearing, the chances of a good neuro outcome are such. But, I just can't bring myself to do it. Literally, folks say that, and that's when they really need therapy, counseling, chaplain, and that kind of thing. But it is, it is a rough, it, it, is, it is a very approximate art. The important thing that I say, though, is, is if you're going to go for it, you can always change the plan later to comfort, cup eight, so to speak, right? <laughs> So it's important that, that what if we made the wrong decision and we're creating a, a life in the existence that dad wouldn't want, right? Well, then you can always go for comfort later. So that's the best that Yeah, I think this, this is such a hard problem. And, and I think what we struggle with is that I can't define for somebody who is unresponsive, critically ill, in a bed, what their ideal quality of life is. And we engage families, we engage you know, friends, we engage the people in the room who are making the decisions for that individual. And what we've actually learned from talking to those people who have made really hard decisions for family members is that they have a definition. We need to kind of sort out what that definition is. Because I think sometimes we come into these conversations and we say things like, I don't know if they're going to do bed bound. Do they want a trach? Do they want a peg? Do they want, I mean, use all these big medical terms. And I've had people say to me, if my dad could just be at my wedding, that's enough. Or I think that my dad would just be happy to have a grandchild sit on their lap. And I think we need to kind of try and figure out what that quality is. I even had family say to me, they kept saying he had a bad quality of life before his cardiac arrest. And they were so offended. And I think we have to be very careful as we approach this conversation, because it's not about my definition of quality. It's about that individual who can't tell us their definition of quality. And the people who know that the best are the people who are sitting around the table. And I do think, that, you know, to, to agree 100%, we often get into this dichotomous, you know, are we going to go or are we going to stop? And the reality is, you can keep trying, 
and you can still say, all right, now it's too much. Day five, day seven, now it's too much. And, and everyone will respect that. I think when we start getting really aggressive and saying, oh gosh, we have to put a trach in on day three, so therefore, let's make a decision right now. I think that's actually not fair to the family. I also think it's not fair to the individual playing in the bed who can't answer those questions. But I think the, the biggest key with this is really querying the people who know that person and really kind of working through that process because sometimes it's not as easy as, you know, a few days in, a, in an L to have a long-term, you know, vent wean or a, sometimes it's as nuanced as I, I think they would be happy if they could even just, you know, be around for their, their children. And that's that. That's their value, not ours. Uh, thank you for sharing your stories and your perspectives. I think it's. I'm, I'm really struck by the stories that um, that these these patients with these near death and death return from death experiences uh, share. And um, it really reminds me of. Uh, so Michael Pollan published a book uh, in the past year called uh, How to Change Your Mind. And he summarizes a lot of research that's been that's been done on uh, people undergoing psychedelic experience. <laughs> so people on uh, they they have the he summarizes studies of people do, doing um, you know people that were either given uh, psilocybin or LSD, but as well as uh, people that are expert meditators, and they they see this common theme of um, the people in the resting state have what's called the default mode network in their brain that's active. It's kind of like your resting state. Um, and it's responsible for the generation of the self, like the, the recognition of self. And they find that in these people, in these distinct conditions, both meditation and under these psychedelic drugs, experience a quieting of the deep, this default mode network. And that correlates with a, a sensation, what people appropriately call ego death, um, which is when they start feeling this connection with the universe um, and connection with other people, and this sense of infinite love. And I'm curious if, if you've if anybody's discussing the, the potential parallels between the quieting of the default mode network and the loss of blood in the brain. Can I, um, let me, so if I may, may I just ask this uh, very quickly. I think that the, the key thing to appreciate, you know, Louise, we've been studying people's experiences for years. We've had literally hundreds if not thousands of cases that we've analyzed. Um, the point I'd like to make is that um, the, the, the tools that people are using to compare drug-induced experiences with experience at the end of life the tools themselves, the research scales, are very inaccurate. For example, you could take a research scale that's trying to define a so-called near-death experience. It has things like, did you feel love? Well, everyone in this room has felt love. Did you feel peace? I guarantee anyone who lives in New York, if you take me out of the city for a few hours <laughs> to a mountain top or somewhere, I promise you, I will feel incredible peace. I'm right here. You just need three or four features. You know, Did you experience a sort of a sense of uh, happiness? Yes. So you put these in and then you suddenly have scored a, a death experience. The problem is the scales were not designed appropriately and they're being used to compare different experiences. What I can say for sure is that we have studied uh, experiences induced by drugs as well and actually there are a lot of differences uh, between them uh, and the experience we will have at the end of life. But of course there are commonalities like people experience love, they experience peace, they experience different things. So I don't know if we have answers but except to say that we have to do a lot more research in that area. And I just realized there were other people, and I'll come to the gentleman over there. I just knew there were other people who had, yes, in the audience who wanted to. I, I would like to ask, how common is it in New York City or beyond for a person who has cardiac arrest or stroke to receive the kind of aggressive and ongoing treatment that you've described? Is it uncommon? Common? I mean, what are your chances? <laughs> A right. lifelong New Yorker who loves questions. Well, I guess we're super questions. fast. Quick, quick answers. It, it a lot needs of questions. to be a lot more common. Uh, to be quite honest, it, like just take hypothermia, right? In 2007, no one was being cool. and we were getting transfers at Columbia. You know, all those transfers were doctors and nurses that had cardiac arrests. Now, 10 years later, it's pretty much the standard of care in New York City. ECPR, ECMO, as a bridge to some definitive treatment, right now almost unheard of in New York City. It's happening in Japan. Uh, it's happening in, in other parts of the world. Uh, and it's happening in Minnesota and being test studied more to come. Well, one thing that everyone can do, even if we can't get ECPR, because certainly at my institution. We define ECPR, I don't uh, remember it. The, the bypass yeah. to try. 
one thing that we all can do is to learn CPR. Um, because even right now in the United States, our, our, our utilization of, of community bystander CPR is dramatically low. So I think we see about 35% on national average. And so European countries are seeing 70%. So we need to really, um, even if we can't get these amazing therapies across the country right now, um, one thing that we all can do is good community and good bystander CPR, because that actually helps outcomes too. It, and it, all you need is a pair of hands. You can learn it in 30 minutes, and it more than doubles life. So you and you have an 80% chance if you use it that you will use it on a loved one mm -hmm. and save their life. In 911, we'll even talk through it. Yeah. What you don't know is we're going to plan to do CPR on it before they leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, um, uh, this whole discussion has some religious overtones. I'd like to go down the list or, or across, across the panel um, and ask each of you just a simple yes or no. Can I tell you something? I do apologize. There are other questions too. Could you okay. just pick on one person? Because I want to get no. Melanie won't invite me back if I don't. This thing, okay. Uh, Dr. Parnia, do you <laughs> consider yourself religious? No, I don't consider myself religious, and I'm glad you're asking me because I didn't get involved in any of this because of anything to do with religion at all. And I also don't believe, and with all respect, I, I respect people's opinions. But I want to explain that religion is very difficult to address because it is so cultural. There are so many aspects of it. What, what, do, what do we even mean when we talk about it? What I do think, though, is that it should be physicians and scientists who are trying to explore what happens when we die. However, at the core, I and mean, this is the part that I do believe, if you have you want to talk about it, at the core of many faiths, many beliefs, many systems of thought throughout time, there is this importance on morality, on your humanity. I absolutely believe on that. Whoever tells me, I believe it 100%. And the patients who come back talk about that as well. The, nobody actually comes back and talks about the rituals and the cultures that they learned, by the way. I have to point that out too. So since it was one question, I'll answer that. Um, I think the lady over there had a question. Did you have a question? Do you have a mic that, uh, that... It was sort of a dress. Oh, okay. Any other questions? A quick question here. Oh, sorry. Right here. Um, so I, quick one over there first. I'm hoping it's a quick question about just language and how we phrase things. At one of my hospitals, the entire system, you can't use DNR. The forms all say allow for natural death. And I've always thought, hey, that's, that's sort of a nice way of phrasing things because I guess the, the whoever came up with those forms was very pessimistic about what DNR could do. But based off what you guys must have learned this morning and where resuscitation science is going, do you think that that's a harmful phraseology or an inaccurate phraseology? It's awesome. I like that. I like it. I think, you know, I, I do like it. I, I think there's something universal about DNR that's helpful. Um, and I only say this because I happen to work in a place that's right smack in the middle of the country and we see a lot of people arriving at our door who are not from Denver, Colorado. Um, and so I think there's something nice about a universal term um, in terms of its applicability and its kind of implementation. Uh, I think some of my colleagues would see that and say, shoot, does this mean I do it or I don't do it? Um, but aside from that, the terminology I think is great. Um, but in terms of the application, how that would carry to other institutions, I think people would get really nervous about should I or should I not. I think most people get it. You say allow for natural death. In other words, DNR. <laughs> As an ER doctor, you know, I would. <laughs> and, and also, I'm not the first person. Often the people are seen by an EMS provider, and so I think it would be a little complicated. That's so. <laughs> what I would have. Any experience with holotropic breathing? I believe that Tibetans use with force hyperventilation to try to generate some psychic. I, I don't know anything about that, and I think we're really trying to explore what happens when people die. What, what kind of breathing are you getting? Uh, Tibetan breathing. Called holotropic. Is that extra breathing? I thought you asked people people's brain when you are really injured. Okay. Okay. The, the point is that most of the, when you, when you read the descriptions of the phenomena, it's exactly the same. The same you know, I think lighting the, the law of the world. You're, you're addressing an interesting point, which is that, um, again, as I said, we don't own death, we don't we own the experience of death, and I forgot to touch on this, which is that, you know, there are historical accounts of people, even going back to Plato's Republic, you know, I see there are apparently descriptions in biblical descriptions of people who've come back to life, 
Um, and we, we showed a picture, a painting from Hieronymus Bosch from the 15th or 16th century that showed what looks like a classical experience, somebody going through a tunnel towards a light. So I, I'm sure that, I don't know how, but I'm sure throughout different cultures, different history, and different civilizations, people have had experiences that relate to death, and they're probably, what's interesting is that they're probably universal and consistent with what we're seeing today, uh, including the small children. Uh, yes, I think this will be the last question for the evening. I think there's a mic. Maybe you could just perhaps use the mic over there. Would you feel it possible? Okay, my question is just about um, the various skeptics um, and how they explain the near death experience. Um, I was wondering what your take is on their explanation about the visual, um, the tunnel of light, how people see the tunnel of light, and um, they attribute it to a possible the visual cortex and how it creates patterns in the brain that are similar to the tunnel. And also how they then um, explain, or maybe they don't, they can't explain, uh, people uh, who, who've had these near-death near experiences corroborating events and uh, procedures that the doctors did while they were not conscious or even seeing things in um, another room that were there then corroborated by their relatives or doctors. I think um, the, the reality is, you know, death is death is a mystery. Um, and I think what we're seeing and we're putting out is the elephant in the room, you know, that people, like anything, right, that we look at things from their own perspective. And when you're looking at a new phenomena that we can't explain, in other words, death was easy, that was the end, there was nothing to talk about. And then suddenly you find there are different phenomena going on. Um, people have tried to explain it. There are incredible theories, like the fact that maybe when your oxygen levels are going down in your brain, you're starting to imagine this tunnel, but <clears throat> none of them have been validated by any research studies, and that's the point I'd like to make. We all deal with patients who have low oxygen levels. Nobody comes back and says, oh, as my oxygen is dropping, I'm starting to see a bit of a tunnel. But from a theory perspective, it was a very good theory. I think I'd, I'd like to say, and, end, and end this with that, that essentially we have gone into a new and uncharted territory, and that is really what that is. And like a lot of things, sometimes we find that our models that we create that can explain one phenomena no longer explain the data that is coming through, and that's what makes us start to change and rethink uh, the ways that we think about things. So we don't have answers, but just to say that um, it, it really can't be explained quite as easily as people have tried to do, although I understand why. Um, you don't have anything to add with it. I'm going to actually end the session tonight before I ask Melanie to come back with just a, uh, something I read recently from Alan Alda. And just going back to this point, the actor Alan Alda recently was quoted as saying, it's amazing that most of us live as if we're not going to die. And the reality is I think what we're trying to show tonight here is that there is a scientific understanding about what happens when we die. It also touches upon our personal, cultural, religious, philosophical, psychological notions. Um, but at least what I'm glad to say is that we have a science that's coming together. Even if we can't answer everything right now, and that we're all looking at it from different facets, whether psychology, philosophy, theology, medicine, biology, I'm sure that there will be a unified science at some point that will explain everything and, and, and put it all together for us. But I think the key thing is just to appreciate that we're just starting on that process. So I hope this has been a helpful uh, session for everyone. I hope none of us face our death. I uh, hope you all find happiness. Uh, do look up Sonia more than you look up me. Uh, but if unfortunately you end up in that situation, we'll do our best to you. the Academy, to Dr. Sam Parnia for moderating this event, to our entire uh, panel who have provided their wisdom this evening, and to all of you for attending tonight. I hope to welcome you all back to a future Academy event. Thank you so much.